to the Capital Mindset Show. We're your hosts, Austin and Fabio. And today we have another episode about a preliminary analysis of something I like to call Fabio's Picks. And that preliminary analysis is on the Walgreens Boots Alliance, ticker symbol WBA. So we're going to be kind of walking through this stock, kind of uh, picking Fabio's brain to see what he likes about this stock and why he really thinks that this is a good business, if he thinks it's, it's a good business. So Fabio, to start, what is this business? What do you like about it? And what does this business do? Okay, so... Uh, this business, you, everyone in the United States, at least, uh, and the UK knows this business uh, because mm. of either Boots or Walgreens. And in the case of those who don't, it's basically a store where you can go and buy things like uh, little food items, makeup, and you can pick up your prescription drugs. So basically, you can consider them as drug stores, convenience stores wrapped into one. And Walgreens is one of two of the largest in the world that the other one being CVS. And something I wanna harp in on Walgreens and CVS later in this preliminary analysis is how the two different companies have chosen to kind of separate into two different strategies as to better produce value for shareholders and their customers. So focusing on Walgreens, Walgreens is a pretty old company now. I think it's, um, I think it's close to becoming a hundred year old business. And it was uh, founded originally as a, uh, 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 well, I can say this about it. They used to actually serve milkshakes, Austin. Did you know that? No, I didn't know that. Yeah, they used I to actually, wow. it was famous to go to Walgreens and get your milkshake. Like you would get your milkshake. And then, yeah. So now they're, uh, <laughs> unfortunately, wow, they that's, don't that's make a dramatic change. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. very dramatic change. Well, they weren't a milkshake store, but they, they did you know, offer milkshakes. Yeah, so I wish they would bring that back. Great, be, great uh, quality milkshakes. I would, I would, well, I don't know. So. We weren't alive. Yeah, true. <laughs> it was that. way before but, our time. <laughs> yeah. But uh, Walgreens has focused on a different strategy. Well, so has CVS in this aspect. They're both copying each other, where Walgreens and CVS are basically uh, trying to uh, integrate or vertically integrate a lot of the healthcare experience. So they're trying to open these clinics. You might have noticed it in your local Walgreens or CVS that they have these clinics and they're trying to expand that business and to do offering more services uh, to their customers. Now, CVS has acquired a, a health insurer. And the problem with that is um, they're, they're getting exposure to, the, on the, um, to interest rates and inflation because they have added risks in, in other parts of their business now that Walgreens does not have because Walgreens has yet to buy one, right? I don't know if they plan on doing that. I don't know what management's thinking, but so far they have not chosen to take that. And I actually like that. I'd prefer them to leave the insurance part of the business off to the actual insurers and CVS. Now we're kind of betting that management can manage the risks of the retail store. And on top of that, adequately manage the risks associated with insurance. I'm sure they have a designated management team to that insurance, but it, it is still different in terms of the culture as to keeping the entities separated. So CVS took that route and Walgreens took a different route where instead they sold their, uh, their drug distribution business to Amerisource Bergen, and they're going to own about 30% of the total uh, business of Amerisource Bergen. And that basically allows them to have a very strong relationship with one of the wholesalers that we were talking about in our Bristol Myers Squibb uh, preliminary analysis video. So uh, essentially, Amerisource Bergen being a, a largely owned by Walgreens Boots Alliance, Walgreens will uh, earn some dividend income over time from that, but also have harbor or foster a strong relationship with that uh, company and they can get good deals on those pharmaceutical products or medical devices coming in. So that's, that's the route they're taking. And then they're also buying, or more recently, if we take a look at some of the share price movement, we see this big jump. And what occurred there was uh, the acquisition of um, a Village MD right here. So Village MD, Walgreens double stake in Village MD with $5.2 billion investment. So this is essentially kind of highlighting the strategy that Walgreens is, is uh, guiding towards, which is essentially integrating the medical service space into their stores and offering customers kind of a one-stop shop. So they want you to come into their store 
and they want you to get, pick up your prescription drugs and also think of them as a place where you can get a checkup. And at the same time, you know, while you're passing through, if you notice the pharmacy is typically at the end of the store, so you have to pass through the convenience store to get there. And you might, you know, pick up milk on your way home, pick up some bag of chips, you know, whatever you want. It's the point of a convenience store. So it's a ways, more ways they can upsell you. So you see here now they're going to uh, own 63% of the uh, combined company or not combined company, but a Village MD. And then mm -hmm. they're going to help Village MD expand into more and more of their stores. So um, now, why do I like that versus the, um, versus the CVS play? Well, because CVS is again, exposing themselves to new risks that Walgreens does not have to worry about, which includes interest rate risk. We're at a historically low point for interest rates. And so should interest rates uh, uh, rise, right? The value of the bonds held on the balance sheets of these insurance companies will fall. And that could present some problems if they were to have to sell. Maybe if not so much if they're held to maturity, that would be fine because you know they're gonna get their dollar. Then you have to worry separately about inflation. So held to maturity bonds will suffer from the inflation. But let's say, let's say they have to uh, sell some bonds to pay out uh, a lot of claims. Right. If interest rates rise, then that's a horrible thing for for that scenario, because you're going to have to sell those bonds at maybe less than what you bought them for. So you're going to have to record those losses. But let's say you held them all to maturity. Well, now you're worried about inflation because inflation is eating away at the value of those those uh, rates that you're getting on those bonds. And maybe, uh, unfortunately, the inflation rate would be will be higher than the actual interest rate you're getting on the bonds held on the balance sheet. And in that case, that's not gonna be recorded very well under GAAP. Uh, the, the inflation effect, it, the uh, GAAP for my understanding still, uh, you could correct me if I'm wrong here, Austin, but GAAP doesn't measure uh, the inflation adjusted return. It simply, uh, uh, it simply measures the nominal return, but then that's missing the, a key part of the story because real returns, are what really matter, okay, to, to kind of play with words there. So here I'm looking at some assumptions I have on this preliminary analysis. And for full disclosure, before I begin here, I already own Walgreens Boots Alliance. I own it at around $37 per share. Well, 30, between $37 and, and $39 per share. On the deep dive, I'll, I'll showcase uh, my position. I've added, well, that's actually the around the first uh, tranches, but because I technically did add more recently when it was in the mid forties. But uh, I, I do own Walgreens. It is a decently sized position. It's not the largest position, but it's decently sized. And uh, I'm looking right now to see if in the deep dive, I might decide to add more or just keep it the same or maybe even sell, I don't know. So right here, I'm looking at some assumptions I can make at today's prices. And let's not assume these buybacks. Let's actually take those buybacks off. So now you can see if I don't assume those buybacks, the, the story now becomes quite aggressive where I have to assume a greater than 10% growth in operations. And I don't think that's necessarily feasible or that's not necessarily uh, fair to, to estimate more than 10%. So I'm gonna cap it at 10%. But I think that Walgreens can grow for sure at 3%. I think if we taper down inflation expectations to 3% per year, I think they'll at least grow at 3%. So in nominal terms, that's what I'm expecting. Mm -hmm. So I don't think they're going to be diluting shareholders. I think that this, I, I've explained in the past in, in, a, in another video, the, the, what irks me a lot about individual creators who, who are or individuals who claim that companies don't need to dilute shareholders because they're well capitalized, blah, 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 blah. Well, to summarize again, the CFO will look at the lowest cost of capital and choose that uh, capital raise in order to get capital to invest in the business. So in this case, I think issuing shares is expensive relative to the debt, especially when you consider that the, let's take a look at what that dividend is. So the dividend yield is around 4%. So that's 4% interest rate. Think of it like that. That's how you, everyone at home can think about it like that. So if I issue new shares, the company is paying an interest rate of 4% and growing because if they want to keep that dividend growth streak, they're going to have to keep growing that stream of dividend income. So they probably don't want to issue those shares. Those shares are now kind of costly. So the debt is typically going to be cheaper 
for Walgreens Boots Alliance longer term. So I don't expect them to dilute shareholders. In fact, I do expect them to do some buybacks. Now, I expect the buybacks, let's take a look at what they, yeah, they've averaged out around at 4%. So let's not, I have here 4%, but let's assume half of 2%. that at 2%. Yeah. So you see now at 2%, I can start to estimate around 6% because we're just about there. And it just now reached, if I take back a look here at the price, it, it reached down to 46. And yeah, it went right back down to 46. It had this run up, but then it went back down to the 46 range. So it was just there. And I actually think five to 6% is, is fairly reasonable. Um, however, when I was looking at the stock originally, I was getting it with the assumption of 3%. So I was very confident, 3% and below. And I was very confident Walgreens could, could achieve that. And on top of that, what I'm gonna be doing is actually reinvesting my dividends. So my share of the business is gonna grow by whatever percentage of the dividends they issue, plus the buybacks. So plus the buybacks. So because of that, I'm going to increase my buyback assumption to reflect my growing interest or an economic interest in the business. And I'm going to just move it up to 3%. So now at 3%, you can see that my assumptions uh, become a little better. So right here at 45, we were, we were just there. We were just there before the run up. And this is where I was when I added more to, to the, to the position, I added uh, uh, another tranche. Now, do I think that Walgreens can't grow at 5%? I'm not saying that. I actually think they could, and it's it's reasonable. So this is pretty beaten down company. I want to show everyone the, the five-year chart, okay? Ooh, so you are boy. buying this. Yeah, we were we were only looking at the one year, so it looked you know nice. But when we look at the five-year chart, this is still a recovery play. This has This is still down 44%. While you are up, if you bought in this range, right, uh, you are still... Uh, down if you bought five years ago. So it's cheap for a reason. And it's cheap more or less because of the deceleration, the risks associated with, with this industry, Amazon factor coming in because Amazon, you know, was opening their own pharmacy, et cetera. So those are some things to think about, but where, where the prices were recently, you are, you can make very low assumptions and actually generate decent returns. And it all depends on the assumptions and how it plays out. But I think I have a decent margin of safety uh, in, in today's prices where I think I'm, I'm comfortable holding the position at the very least, not necessarily adding. Again, I, I would like to buy it when my assumptions are under the 3%. And let's just go with 4% again to show. But if I, if they, or if I can grow my economic interest every year by about 4%, then, then, we're, then um, it's fair game here for me. But I am not, I, I'm not yet comfortable with uh, assuming that. And actually, by the way, when I was first buying this, my model was returning to me um, uh, at a at a RRR of greater than twenty percent. I think I was discounting it at 25, uh, 25 almost or thirty percent. But um, and we can kind of play with that here. I, I I'm pretty sure it was might have been yeah, it was twenty five. I think it was twenty five now because uh, it, that's, that's above the buy price where I bought. And that was the assumption. So now, Fabio, I have a bunch of questions. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and with the question, because they probably... The, the very first, it's, it's more so a statement, but um, I noticed too that Cardinal Health has a strategic partnership with CVS. And I'm glad to see actually that Walgreens actually has now a strategic partnership with Amerisource Bergen. And so something that's kind of interesting to note about that too, is I kind of want to touch on the way that these firms are sort of approaching these bigger pharmaceutical providers as I think, I think, I think that's what I can probably call them. Yeah. Pharmaceutical providers, the way that they're kind of approaching them, how Walgreens is differentiating their strategy when it comes to partnering with these pharmaceutical providers. And then the second um, question that I kind of have here too, is that CVS kind of already has built in walk-in clinics inside of them where you can go in, you can kind of get a checkup. If you have like, let's say pink eye or something, you can receive your, um, your medicines and then you can leave. And it's, it's now you noted earlier that, um, Walgreens is acquiring or has already acquired village MD. My question to you, Fabio, and it's my second question is how does this acquisition then differ from what CVS is already doing? Like how is the acquisition of village MD different 
from the walk-in clinic that CVS oftentimes offers? That's, that's kind of my question. And then my third question here too, is sort of, if you don't think that they're going to be diluting shareholders into the future and that they're going to be then incurring debt as a part of their capital structure, what other than really interest rates, what kind of other risks are you seeing here with Walgreens funding themselves through debt? Now, that might sound like a very basic question, but what I've come to realize is that Fabio likes to scratch way beneath the surface of these sorts of things. So I'm asking him a specific question that might appear basic related to debt, because I want to see how Fabio's mind works with these sorts of things for some of maybe our new viewers tuning in and, and listening to this. So Fabio, to, to summarize, um, the first question is, how is Walgreens differentiating its strategy in regards to pharmaceutical providers, um, strategic um, alliances? I think that's, that's the term we would use. The second mm -hmm. one is, how does the acquisition of Village MD differ from what CVS is currently doing with its walk-in clinics, if it even differs at all? And then the third one is, what are the risks associated with a, not a pure, that wouldn't be the right term, but for lack of a better term, word coming to my mind, a pure debt capital structure in regards to Walgreens Boots Alliance. Okay. So, uh, so the, to answer the first one, yes, you, you put it, you put it nicely, the, the word, uh, strategic partnerships. So by owning 30% or around 30% of your partner, you're going to have some nice relationships with them, right? Because mm -hmm. you are one of their largest shareholders and Walgreens owning such a large stake in Amerisource Bergen is more likely to be able to secure uh, better deals because they're a large owner. Now, Cardinal Health has a partnership with CVS. You, you pointed that out. And mm -hmm. uh, for those who may not know, and uh, we were probably doing a video on, on Cardinal Health as well. 100%. Yeah, oh, we yeah. have to. We have to. Cardinal Health is, is already a... Um, I've, I've already bought a decent amount of Cardinal Health recently. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> so... Yeah. So we, we, did, we did the research on, on that relationship too. And, and basically C, uh, CVS elected not to own for, for reasons you know, that they, didn't, they weren't in that business to begin with. Walgreens was, so Walgreens wanted to exit that position and they sold it to Amerisource Bergen in return for uh, some cash and more percentage ownership of Amerisource Bergen. So it was a win-win. And they were already in a relationship with Mayor Source Bergen. So uh, for them, they elected to do that. While CVS instead focused their acquisition strategy on the health insurance. And then that opens them up to other risks, as I discussed in, already in the video. So for question two, uh, what is the separation between Village MD and- uh, Basically what CVS, CVS is doing now in regards to the walk-in clinics. So think about it like this. So the CVS walk-in clinics, they are part of CVS's operations. While Village MD was a separate company that had investment by Walgreens, right? And on the surface, they're the same, okay? But the difference is, I guess, in the potential you see for the uh, operational leverage that Village MD has over what, let's say, uh, CVS's version of it. Because Village MD being a separate company, uh, it's it's going to be micromanaged differently. Okay. So Walgreens is going to be 60% owner, but that 30% ownership stake is still with the um, original owners. 40%. Right? Yeah. 40%. Sorry. 40% because they own 60%. Yeah. So 40% is still with the original owner. So those owners who are operating the business have a still have a huge vested interest in the continual growth and improvement of Village MD to acquire more customers. So it's kind of like, uh, if it's kind of like me buying uh, Walgreens and I'm not running Walgreens, I'm allowing the management team to run Walgreens. And by the way, I didn't discuss this, but Walgreens also has one very large shareholder who uh, is still president of the company. He, he stepped down as CEO, but he's president of the company and um, has he has a vested interest just as me for Walgreens to do well, pay out dividends, return capital shareholders, and maybe even the share price growing. So we are, are we have same best vested interests. So that's basically what Walgreens is doing with Village MD, while CVS is not necessarily the case. CVS is kind of trying to manage the whole thing, and again, mm -hmm. which is why I, I prefer Walgreens' strategy, where they're where they're having thirty percent ownership in Marisource Bergen, but Marisource Bergen is going to do its own thing. Walgreens will benefit as an owner. Okay, then on top of that, Walgreens also owns sixty percent of 
VillageMD, but VillageMD is still being run by its operators and they have the same vested interest in the success of VillageMD, but it allows Walgreens management team to be focused on what uh, they can uh, differentiate themselves in, which is in that retail space, the drugstore space, okay? So it allows them to be focused instead of focusing their energy on different uh, business avenues, but at the same time, participating in the economic interest of those different businesses. And then, so to answer the third question, so I hope that answered the second question as to the different it approaches. Did. Kind of, kind of a, uh, a second, comment on, mm -hmm. on, the, uh, on the second question too, just to make sure that I'm following along too. It almost sounds like Walgreens is sort of not exactly operating as a spawner, but as kind of a spawner by proxy in essence, like they're investing yeah. in, 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 in businesses and their strategy is more so not exactly consolidation might be consolidation, but it's more so, um, having a vested economic interest in these specific business entities while mitigating the risk. Now that's a very basic summary, but that's basically what I'm getting from yeah. everything that you had just told me. And so the third question, just to recap, well, I is add some more yes. information that CVS actually did acquire um, minute clinic in 2006. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm, I'm basically confirming that if you didn't catch that uh, minute clinic, the CVS variant is wholly owned by CVS. And so unlike uh, Village MD, the management is kind of just integrated. CVS is the sole shareholder of, of a minute clinic. Mm, okay. And so the third and final question is more so other the than, risks, right? yeah, yeah. And like, and like, the reason why I'm asking this, and I recapped it earlier, was because it might appear very basic to people why sometimes like the risks associated with debt financing. But yeah. the reason why I'm asking you is because you are able to like the surface level and you go way below the surface level and you explain things in ways that the audience might not have considered before. So that's kind of where I'm operating from here, Fabio, just, just so you're aware. But now the stage is yours, my friend, for the... Uh... <laughs> So um, there, there are the, the risks with debt financing typically refer to, um, are kind of in line with the risk that you miss a payment and the seizure of assets, because typically when you miss the, the payments, the bondholders can take control of the business because they are, they are uh, at the top of the hierarchy in terms of uh, returns, right? So first it's them that must get paid. Then the shareholders are the last. They, shareholders take on all the risk, which is why most of the reward is at the feet of the shareholders if things go well, all right? So you're actually being compensated for the risk by owning shares of the business. So the reason why uh, Walgreens is more likely going to elect to use debt rather than issuing shares is a lot to do with the uh, dividends that they pay out. I mean, unless they're irresponsible business, but they're right now in a mature industry, their credit rating is good, okay? So, they're, so that tells me already, that their cost of capital in the debt markets is going to be lower because of the high credit rating. And then on top of that, they have a um, they have a historical reputation for operations. So that you know again brings down those interest rates because th those interest rates that you'll see for Walgreens are going to be lower than that of a startup, for example. Mm -hmm. So a startup will elect to issue shares rather than debt because the debt's going to be very expensive because the debt um, the debt is going to ask well what is what are your cash flows. Uh, what are your assets? Uh, what are your, um, when are you projected to make money? And sometimes in some instances, lenders will not even lend money to companies that don't make any money. So it's a little more difficult to raise capital that way. So you elect to use shares because shares, what you're doing is you're diluting future earnings, right? Future earnings uh, disbursement among the owners because you're creating more shares to share those earnings with. So, and you're usually not paying a dividend right at the moment, but Walgreens is what we know as a dividend aristocrat. So an entity that has paid dividends for uh, and increased those dividends for 25 years in a row. And if they issue tons of shares, what they're basically doing is they're going to pay that dividend out as the cost of that equity. And then plus all those dividend increases that they continue to go forward. And they're incentivized to keep growing that dividend because uh, once you become a dividend aristocrat, you get added to all these different indexes. And on top of that, your, a lot of your shareholder base starts to get into that more uh, dividend-focused shareholder base because that's your, the return of capital they choose to uh, elect. And you'd have to consider um, the, the, the price to, or price to free cash flow, let's say, 
of Walgreens is low enough that if they start issuing tons of shares, that is very costly as well. So that's another way to measure the same thing. You could measure that dividend yield, but sometimes that dividend yield is not a good measure. But another way of measuring the same thing or in a different way is taking a look at the price of the shares relative to the cash output of that company. And if it's low, you don't want them to be issuing tons of shares because that's, in the, that's how you can kind of uh, tell, or it's a quick way of telling, uh, oh, that's very expensive capital raise that they're doing. So if the, if the stock price is very overvalued and the price to free cash flow or the price to, or the PE is uh, very high, um, then you actually want them to issue shares because that might be that it's, it's cheaper. So you can do that by what's called an earnings yield, right? So if you take the uh, percent, so you take the earnings divided by the price, right? And then you get a percentage that think of it as like your interest rate again, another way of thinking about it. So you want to make sure with everything that if they were to do that, it has to make sense. And in this case, I don't expect them to do that. And I see that they're not doing that. I see that they're just buying back shares because uh, I'm correct that the debt is the cheaper method of issuing capital or raising capital and issuing shares would be more expensive. And in fact, they're the CFO uh, and the CEO, the management team has elected to buy back shares over time, mm -hmm. not issue new shares for that very reason, because you, you, you don't want to do that in, in this moment in time. So it, it almost also sounds like to me too, that the cost of capital, basically the cost of debt capital, it almost, because the cost of debt capital is more favorable for Walgreens, that is by both explicitly and implicitly rewarding shareholders. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, those were pretty much all the questions I had audience. I'm sure you can tell Fabio offered a pretty extensive analysis of debt financing right there. <laughs> Just oh, like I knew, I yes. knew, well, yeah, yeah. This is surface level for Fabio, but okay. So, so we will be doing a deep dive onto Walgreens in and of itself. And so Fabio, do you have any closing thoughts before I wrap us up here today? No, only that um, I, for full disclosure, I already have an investment in Walgreens, um, mm -hmm. but that when we do the deep dive, uh, it's going to be like me refreshing myself and thinking about whether I want to add, redact, or completely sell out of the position. Um, most likely, I'm going to elect to just keep the position. Uh, so from what I see now, that's my conclusion, that I, I think not, not much has changed in terms of the fundamentals. I'm happy with where my position, at, how it's performed. It's performed actually in line with what my model was saying I would perform. I believe I am mm -hmm. up uh, greater than uh, my 20% required rate of return already. And, um, and that was because I bought it at a nice margin of safety. So I'm happy with that investment. Um, but uh, going forward, I need to see whether or not the expectations have changed or maybe the growth has uh, gone, gotten ahead of itself. But we'll see. That'll be for the DD. Yeah. And so something else about this too, for full disclosure, I do not own a position in this. So I'm going to probably, I'm definitely going to come into this as unbiased as possible. And basically as I go throughout my own due diligence of this stock, I'm going to be quite literally deciding if I decide to buy into this company or not. And I will be summarizing that conclusion during our deep dive analysis of Walgreens. So you've heard it here, folks. This is the Capital Mindset Show. We're your hosts, Austin and Fabio. Please be sure to visit our website at capitalmindset.org. We provide a lot of free resources there and things that you can take advantage of. Also, if you scroll down to the bottom of the homepage, you can find a contact us form where if you want us to do any preliminary analysis, summarize any sort of um, accounting or finance topics, or even do a deep dive analysis onto specific stocks in and of itself, then we would definitely encourage you to scroll all the way down our homepage here. And you will see the contact us form right here. As always, though, we are not licensed or registered financial advisors, so we will not be offering financial advice. But we really hope also that you share our video because that really helps out our channel. And also, please be sure to like the video because that really helps the YouTube algorithm. And if, you've, if, you've, if you have any other thoughts regarding Walgreens, please be sure to comment. We do respond to all comments. And so this is the Capital Mindset Show. We're your hosts, Austin and Fabio, and we look forward to seeing you guys again. Take care.